Welcome back to Heroes of the Faith, a show where we are inspired by the lives of the saints so that we can become saints ourselves. I'm your host, Isaac Longworth, and I remember this one time in high school, I was in grade 12, my class was going on a field trip. And we were going on a field trip that was focused on world religions. Over the year, we'd been learning about Islam and Hinduism and Buddhism and all these different world religions. And now the field trip was going to take us to all these different temples and religious places so that we could actually learn from people who practice this. And it was a very interesting field trip. I actually really enjoyed it. But the very last stop of the day was at a Buddhist temple. And as we came in to the building, the monks who were there instructed us on what Buddhism was all about and, and how they prayed. But then instead of all the other sites that had just told us about how they prayed, these Buddhist monks then said, and now we're going to pray to the Buddha right now. And I want all of you to join in. And I thought to myself, well, hold on a second. I'm not Buddhist. I'm Catholic. I don't worship the God of the Buddhists. I, I, this isn't my worship. And yet all of us were instructed, even by our Catholic school teachers, to bow down before this giant golden statue of the Buddha while the, the monks chanted and burned incense before him. And I was like, there is no way I'm doing this. And so even though all of my class and all of my school teachers bowed down and laid their faces on the ground in front of this Buddhist God, I refused and I stood the whole time. Now, luckily for me, since all of my Catholic school teachers were in the front row bowing to Buddha, they never actually saw me standing and refusing to join in. And so I didn't get into any trouble. But later on the bus, some of my friends were asking me, like, Isaac, why didn't you just bow down? You looked so weird standing while literally the entire room was bowing. Why didn't you just show honor and respect to this Buddhist God, even though you don't believe in him as a Christian? And I told them one of the reasons I'm so emphatic about this is because I refuse to worship a false God. I will worship only the one true God. And there have been thousands of Christians throughout the history of the church who have literally died, have lost their lives because they refused to bow down to false gods. And one of those saints is today's saint, Saint Paul Mickey, a Japanese saint who was put to death. He was killed for refusing to worship the Buddha and instead proclaiming to his country, primarily of Buddhist people, that Jesus Christ alone is God and he is the only way to salvation. So if someone like St. Paul Mickey is willing to lose his life rather than bow down to the Buddha, I can certainly risk a few weird stares from my classmates to do the same. Well, St. Paul Mickey was born in 1564. He was born, like I said, in Japan, in a region close to the port city of Osaka. And his family was quite wealthy, and he lacked nothing growing up. Now, the Mickey family, like most of the other Japanese families of the time, were Buddhist. And Buddhism, if you don't know too much about it, it is a religion that was originally started in India. And according to Buddhist tradition, there was this Indian prince who grew tired with all of the lavish lifestyle he was living. He saw the emptiness of it. And so he set out to find the true meaning of life. So he gave up all of his riches and he sat under a tree and meditated on what the meaning of life was until he reached a stage of enlightenment. And that's actually what the Buddha means. It means the enlightened one. And so this Buddha's supposed enlightenment on the true meaning of life was this. He believed that life was full of suffering, sickness, death, poverty, war, all of human suffering, and that reincarnation happened every time you died. So every time you died, you still couldn't escape the suffering of life because you're reborn and it begins all over again. And so life is this endless cycle of suffering. Now, he believed that all suffering comes from desire for something. So because you have a desire for health, when you're sick, you're suffering. Or because you have uh, a desire to be rich, and if you're poor, then that's where suffering comes from. And so he believed that the solution to avoiding all suffering is to reach a point where you don't desire anything more. Because if you don't desire to be healthy and you're sick, apparently that won't cause you suffering because you don't desire to be healthy anyways. 
And so to reach this point, you have to follow the teachings of the Buddha in Buddhism. So that includes uh, meditation, doing good deeds, and basically becoming more and more detached from any desires in life. And so the more you meditate, the more you detach yourself, the better your next life will be when you're reincarnated. And you just keep moving up and up and up this reincarnation wheel until eventually you reach a state of perfect detachment where you don't care about anything. You have no more desire for anything. And thus, according to the Buddha, you no longer suffer. And it's at this point that you reach the goal of Buddhism called nirvana which is where you break the cycle of reincarnation because when you die, you no longer are reborn. You literally stop existing. And so the solution to suffering for Buddhism is to stop existing. Since existence is suffering, you break the wheel of reincarnation and you escape from it by ceasing to exist. So as you can see, even though Buddhism tries to find an answer to human suffering, it ends up being a pretty empty and extremely depressing religion. Because for starters, it's all up to us, how hard we meditate, the good that we do in life, and there's no heaven or beautiful afterlife to strive for. The goal of Buddhism is to stop existing, to cease to be, and to vanish into nothingness. That's their whole goal. So it's a very depressing religion if you think about it. And the Mikis were trapped in this false religion until one day they heard of a different kind of faith that promised a hope. And a joy that they had never heard about in Buddhism. And that was Christianity. You see, about 15 years earlier, St. Francis Xavier, who I've done a show on in the past, had made a missionary journey to Japan. And he had brought them the gospel of Jesus for the very first time. No one in Japan had ever heard about Jesus before St. Francis Xavier came. And so Francis Xavier had established several Christian communities on Japan. He had baptized and taught them the faith, and it was beginning to spread. And it had spread from person to person. And over the years, former Buddhists had converted and come to faith in Jesus. Even though Christians were still a very small portion of the population, there was many, many Christians. And so the Mikis heard of Jesus for the first time, and they were amazed by what they heard. They learned from the Christian missionaries that Yes, there is suffering in this life, absolutely, but that we weren't made for this life anyways, that we were made for eternal happiness with God in heaven, which was such a better goal than ceasing to exist, that the goal of our life was actually to escape this world of suffering, to go to be forever with God in heaven, rejoicing and happy in him. And the solution in Christianity was so much better than Buddhism because the solution in Christianity isn't to stop caring about anything, to kill all of your desires, but rather, for a Christian, it was to realize how much God cares for us. That it's not bad for us to desire good things because we actually all desire God deep down and he is the best good of all. And he desires us to be happy with him forever and so we desire that and so when we reach heaven, we are perfectly fulfilled in him. And so the Mikis, when they heard this, they saw the emptiness of their Buddhist worldview and they left it behind and they turned to Jesus. The whole family decided to convert when Paul was about five years old and he was baptized along with his parents. Now the Jesuit priests who had been sent to Japan as missionaries had founded a school. And so Paul's parents sent him there to receive his education in a place that would continue to grow his faith. But times were about to become very difficult for the Christians of Japan because the leader of Japan at the time was a powerful man named Toyotomi Hideyoshi. And Hideyoshi was worried that the spread of Christianity in his country was weakening the nation from the inside. Because in his mind, if he thought there are some Buddhists and there's some Christians, that means we're divided. We don't all have the same religion and that weakens us from within. And so Hideyoshi published an edict that banished Catholic missionaries from the country of Japan. And this is actually what the edict said. I want to read part of it to you so that you can see what the Christians of Japan were facing. Hideyoshi wrote, Even though Japan is a country protected by its own gods, it is completely unreasonable to introduce the evil law from the Christian country 
And by speaking about the evil law, he's talking about the teachings of Christianity. And so he goes on and writes, it is not possible to have a Christian missionary in Japan. So get ready because in 20 days from today, you must return to your Christian country. So with this edict, Hideyoshi banned Christian missionaries from the country. But even though he had done this, he still wanted to maintain trade with the Christian countries of Europe. And so the rules that he put in place were not enforced very strictly at this point. But still, it was showing the growing hostility that was rising up towards Christians in Japan. And this was a very nervous time for Paul. Imagine what it must have been like hearing the leader of your country banning Christian missionaries and trying to suppress Christian growth and you yourself are a Christian and you know that your leader has absolute power to do whatever he wants in his country. And yet, Paul decided to stay strong in his faith. Despite the disturbing anti-Catholic trends he was seeing in Japan, when he was 22 years old, he bravely decided to go even further in his faith by joining the Jesuit seminary in order to study for the priesthood. And so Paul became a seminarian studying to become a Catholic priest. And this was a very exciting thing for the Jesuits because most of the missionaries in Japan were from other countries who had come there to tell the people about Jesus. But Paul wanted to be a native-born Japanese priest, someone who would be able to bring the gospel to the Japanese people as one of their own. But Paul, I love this about Paul, he didn't wait to be a priest to share the gospel with people. In fact, even as a seminarian, Paul became well-known in Japan for his gift of preaching and evangelization. And he spoke tirelessly, passionately, convincingly to all of his fellow Japanese countrymen urging them to leave Buddhism behind and to follow Jesus. He shared the testimony of his family, how they had grown up Buddhists, that was all they had known, and yet they had found hope and joy in Jesus that Buddhism just could not offer. And he told them, look, it's not up to us to climb our way up the ladder of reincarnation by our own good deeds and hard meditation practices. We can't do it. We're too weak. God sent his son Jesus to do all the heavy lifting for us. He sent him to do the work for us, to rescue us, to give us the free gift of salvation that we can't earn. Paul told them Jesus took the suffering of the world upon himself, the suffering that we're all trying to escape from. He took that suffering upon himself when he died on the cross for us, and he gave suffering itself meaning. Instead of in Buddhism where suffering is just something that is to be avoided at all cost, even at the cost of stopping to exist. He says, no, Christianity says that by suffering with Jesus, we too can receive the glory that he offers us in heaven. And people were really listening to him. What he had to say was actually resonating with them because as a Japanese man who had been raised in a Buddhist culture, he was able to speak to them in a way that would make sense to them. He wasn't a foreign missionary from Europe. He was one of them. He was appealing to them to be baptized as a Christian, even though it was becoming much more hostile to embrace the Christian faith. And so his bravery inspired them. They looked at this guy and they thought, well, he is willing to tell us about Jesus, even though the leader of our country, Hideyoshi, has banned missionaries. There must be something about this faith because he's willing to risk his life to tell us about it. And so as a result, Paul led many of his people out of Buddhism and into the Catholic Church. Now, when Paul was only a few months away from his ordination, Hideyoshi ramped up his anti-Christian rhetoric, and he actually began ordering the arrest of Christians, especially those who were actively working to spread the gospel in Japan. Now, of course, the zealous Paul was an obvious target for an arrest like this because he had been preaching the gospel all over the place, bringing many Buddhists into the Christian faith. And so during the roundup of Catholics, he was arrested along with 25 others where they were put in prison and awaited trial. Now, the trial for Paul and his companions was very short because all of them were unapologetic about the fact that they were Catholics and they were not going to abandon their faith. 
They were not going to return to Buddhism and bow down to Buddha as they had previously. They were Christians now. And in response to their defiance, Hideyoshi wanted to make an example of them and to stamp out Christianity once and for all. And so Paul Mickey and the other Christians were condemned to first be publicly shamed before being executed for their faith. And the way that they were publicly shamed was that they had their earlobe cut off and they were paraded through the street, which was a Japanese form of shaming, which would have been almost unbearable in their culture. Their culture was very focused on shame and honor. And so to have your ear notched like that and paraded through the streets would have been a source of great embarrassment for them. And yet rather than letting this public shaming get to him, Paul rejoiced in the fact that he had been counted worthy to suffer like this for Jesus. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, St. Paul, his namesake, had written, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. And Paul Mickey accepted this and rejoiced in this fact. He knew that he had faith, and so he was not ashamed that his country found Christianity to be embarrassing. He was confident in his identity as a Christian, and he was not going to let that be taken away from him. Paul and the others were led under guard to the city of Nagasaki, which is where their executions were going to take place. And Paul was tied to a cross with ropes around his arms and legs, and a collar was fastened around his neck before his cross was hoisted up alongside all the others. And while all the other Christians were being tied to their crosses and being lifted up in preparation for their death, Paul began to preach to his final audience. He began to preach to the very people who were putting him to death and the entire crowd who would come to watch the executions take place. And this is the actual words that Paul said. An eyewitness recorded his final speech from the cross as he was preparing for his own death. And this is what he said to the crowd. He said, arriving at this moment in my existence, I believe that no one of you thinks that I want to hide the truth. That is why I declare to you that there is no other way of salvation than the one followed by Christians. Since this way teaches me to forgive my enemies and all who have offended me, I willingly forgive the king and all those who have desired my death. And I pray that they too will obtain the desire for Christian baptism. It's amazing to me that on the cross, as his enemies are preparing to kill him, he is still preaching Jesus to them. He's still saying there is time. Repent, turn away from your false religion and come to faith in Jesus. And I forgive you for killing me. I forgive you for your hatred towards me. I want you to be in heaven with me one day. It's just amazing. Well, one of the executioners began to read the fake crimes of the Christians to the crowd in order to validate their reason for killing them. And so this guy began lying about the Christians, saying that they were all foreigners from Europe and from the Philippines who had come to Japan to infiltrate their country. And while he was speaking, Paul boldly spoke over these lies. He began to shout out the truth, explaining exactly why they were being killed. And again, these are his real words. He said, the sentence of judgment says that these men came to Japan from the Philippines, but I did not come from any other country. I am a true Japanese man. And the only reason for my being killed is that I have taught the doctrines of Christ. I certainly did teach the doctrines of Christ. And I thank God that it is for this reason I die. I believe that I am telling only the truth before I die. I know you believe me and I want to say to you all once again, ask Christ to help you to become happy. I obey Christ. After Christ's example, I forgive my persecutors. I do not hate them. And I ask God to have pity on all. And I hope that my blood will fall on my fellow men as a fruitful rain. Again, this beautiful speech where he's saying that Christ brings true happiness. We are not being killed because we are spies from another country. We are being killed because we are obedient to Christ and his teaching. And he's praying that his blood will act like a rain 
that will bring up a fruit of faith in Japan with many more Christians coming after him. Now, after this speech, two executioners were assigned to each Christian who was tied to a cross, and each guard was holding a long spear to kill their captive when the signal was given. And so seeing the spear, Paul turned to one of his companions on the cross beside him and said, Like my master, I too shall die upon a cross, and like him, a lance will pierce my heart so that my blood and my love can flow out upon this land and sanctify it to his name. And then all the Christians together broke out into one final song, a hymn of praise to God. And eyewitnesses of the day described how the executioners actually waited respectfully for them to stop singing before the deadly signal was finally given. And Paul and the other Christians were all stabbed with the spears of their executioners. And one spear went into each one of their sides, going up through their body and coming out their shoulder, killing them on the spot. Paul and his companions were the first martyrs in a wave of persecution that would claim the lives of many more Japanese Christians in the coming year. Now, I love St. Paul Mickey because he didn't wait to be a priest to start telling people about Jesus. No, he saw that his nation was trapped in a false religion that proposed a release from the pain of the world, but actually left people in a state of despair. And there are still many people today who believe in the teachings of the Buddha. You might have them as co-workers or friends or classmates. And all of them are trying to commit existential suicide as a way to escape the sufferings of life because that's what the Buddha taught them to do. Now, I don't know personally many Buddhists in my life, but I do know many people, even those who are atheists, who ascribe to the Buddha's teachings because they want to find peace in the meditation practices, in the prayers, in the actions, and it's all a dead end. It will not bring true joy or peace because I know that only Jesus can do that. And so as Christians, like Paul Mickey, we have an obligation to tell them about this. In a, in a very loving and charitable way, we have to tell them that their religion will never bring them true happiness. That only Jesus can do that. That he is the only way to salvation, just like Paul Mickey preached from the cross. Now, that doesn't mean that when we tell people about Jesus, that it will always be successful. I remember once I did have a Buddhist friend and many years ago I was talking with her about faith and I shared the gospel with her and I told her what Jesus had done and I told her about the one true God and that I believed that she was in a religion that really could not save, that it could not lead to life, that it was a hopeless path. And she was very respectful and listening and we talked about it for, for a long time, but in the end, she did not become a Christian. She, she did refuse it. And that's not my fault. All I could do was make the offer. Just like St. Paul Mickey, we can't force anyone to become a Christian. All we can do is invite. All we can do is present. And who knows, maybe the seed that I planted in her one day, she'll think back to that conversation she had with that crazy Catholic and think to herself, maybe there is something to this. And she'll turn in faith to the one true God. I don't know. All I know is that if I knew the way to heaven and I didn't share it with my Buddhist friend, that would have been so selfish of me. To have the good news and not to share it with someone out of fear of offending them or out of fear of damaging the friendship, that would be the most selfish thing in the world. We need to open our mouths and share the gospel of Jesus with people and give them the chance to know God. That's what St. Paul Mickey did. And now he's in heaven enjoying God for all of eternity. And so let's pray to St. Paul Mickey that we would become saints just like he was. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Paul Mickey, you never stopped telling people about Jesus, even when it grew dangerous, even when you were arrested and were sentenced to death. From your own cross, you continued to preach to people about the good news of Jesus Christ. Give us that same courage. Give us your boldness and your fire to be able to share the gospel with those in our lives, those who we love, so that we can lead them to Jesus, just like you led so many of your own Japanese people 
to faith in the one true God. St. Paul Mickey, right now I just pray for all people around the world who are trapped in the religion of Buddhism. I pray for Buddhists all over the world that someone would come into their life and share Jesus with them. Lord, I pray right now if there are any Buddhists listening to this, that they would be moved to seek out Jesus and the true happiness that he offers, the true escape from suffering that he offers, not through no longer existing and killing all of your desires, but through an awareness that we desire the greatest good of all God and that he wants us to exist forever with him in happiness and bliss in heaven. Help us as Christians to have the courage and the love to proclaim Jesus to our Buddhist friends, to our co-workers, to those who we meet, so that we can act as a messenger of God's hope and peace to them and lead them closer to true faith in Christ. St. Paul Mickey, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.